It's still just a couple minutes early, but it looks like everybody except Robbie is, is seated, and he, he just doesn't sit down anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, I want to bow our heads and before we begin our service. Our Father, we're very grateful for all that you do and all that you give us. Our Father, we pray that you'd be with us this day. Our Father, as we strive to understand, please open our hearts and minds that we might see. We stumble along at time in the scriptures as the men who were traveling to Emmaus, and it wasn't until Jesus opened their understanding. Help us, our Father, to do the best we can, and then bless us richly. Forgive us of our wrongs. Guide us in the way of the Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, and amen. <clears throat> And I don't know whether it's an opportune or an inopportune time that, uh, uh, that uh, I'm beginning to teach in the place that Aiden had. <laughs> but I, I think I would, I would rather about been anywhere than in the chapter that talks about the covering. Uh, I think it's just a new year. I don't think there was anything devious in his mind, but I have to admit there's just a little bit of doubt <laughs> about that. Uh, thank you for being here. I, I want to uh, I want to praise the elders. Uh, I've kind of all for years have been someone who has been against going to uh, to having one service, but I can certainly see that we have men who are concerned about the needs and and the wishes of the church within the confines of what's right within the Scripture, and uh, uh, we're lucky to have them. We pray for them, especially we're praying for Tino because we know he is, he's still recovering from COVID. And uh, uh, he, like some of the rest of us, has other health issues. I'm going to be talking with you about the principle of, of headship and uh, how it relates, uh, how the covering relates to that headship. Uh, I have talked with Keith and he has agreed that uh, uh, that I'm going to teach today and also on Wednesday, and then he's going to come back next Sunday uh, and, and then Wednesday because I'm going to be doing quite a bit of lectureship. I want to go get through this uh, to make, uh, to make uh, my case, to make a point. Uh, as you know, if you've looked at this subject at all, and that you know that there's a, a lot of different ideas and opinions uh, about uh, what is taught in the first half of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which deals with, with uh, uh, a covering. Uh, so with that in mind, let's open our minds and our hearts as we look to the scriptures. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 2 and 3, as you see on, on the board, uh, it says, Paul said, I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and that you keep the traditions just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. When Paul says that you remember me in all things, uh, he, he really didn't leave them without information. I don't think he left them without information on this. When Paul and Apollos taught at Corinth, I have little doubt but what they were taught they were taught what was right concerning this as well as other things that uh, they, uh, they seemed to have difficulty with and sometimes they, they failed to understand and sometimes they just seemed like they, they might have liked to, to argue. Uh, but they had been taught, remember, and uh, there's, there's traditions like in vain they do worship me teaching as doctrines or traditions, the commandments of men. I think we're just looking at the Word of God, at apostolic traditions. I think what we're going to see as we look in this chapter, he t he's going to talk about prevailing customs of the time. But here I don't think it's anything so whimsical. I think he, he's saying, you, you've been taught the Word of God. You should be prepared. You should, you should, you ha you've had enough information to know these things. Uh, Paul then... 
Uh, he gets to the main point of, I, I write the whole chapter, that's really not true. It, the first 16 verses of this, he gets, to the, he gets right to the point about what this is all about. And that's, that, that's, found, uh, that's found there in, in verse 3. Uh, he says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. I think this is the key verse in all of these 16. This is the key. He's talking, he's talking about authority or being willing to submit to authority. That, I really, that's what it's all about. It's not really about uh, the, the covering per se. It's, it's about being obedient and when God lays down who's in control, then obviously he is God. It, uh, and uh, uh, we need to be willing to give in, uh, submit, as you will, our own ideas and just follow the God of heaven. Uh, uh, in uh, the head of every man is Christ. The head of every woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. He said, he's setting the foundation upon what he is about to say. That God himself has ordained that there's a certain order when it comes to authority. Uh, and God has established principles, Paul says, that he expects us all to obey just as Jesus did. Jesus, just as Jesus submitted uh, to the will of the Father. When, when you're talking about head, I, I've, noticed, I've noticed off and on through the years that when some look at the word head here, the, the head uh, of, uh, uh, of the man is Christ, for instance. Some say it, it's just talking about source, like the head of the river. I don't think so. I think he's talking about authority. And I, I think just trying to, it almost seems like those who say that are just trying to skirt, they're trying to get around what God is, is teaching us uh, in this chapter. And with, with that in mind, uh, it, it's headship. It's authority. God has put in authority. Uh, it means to have the appropriate responsibility and to take the lead, to be the leader. I really think there's a lot about this chapter that I don't know. And I know that uh, there are very brilliant men. I'm not even, I mean, all I can do is just look up when I think about the men who are brilliant and yet have so many ideas about what is being taught here. So there, 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 is nothing, there is nothing presumptuous or arrogant in what I say. I've spent a lot of time looking at it and studying it. But I still, I still question whether I'm right. It, I do. That, it, that's not the only subject, but this one comes kind of to the top. I look at it, and I do the very best I can, and I still question I just can do the best I can, but you know, I question whether I'm right. Res? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I've, for what it's worth, I've thought the same. But let, let, uh, let's, let's look on and, uh, and, and see, see if we can understand that some things are plain, while the other things are, are very vague. I, I have said this in another context to you before. I, I want to repeat this. Uh, I, had, I had a difference uh, of opinion with, uh, with Barbara Ellis. And you have to understand that I was good friends of Chet and Barbara. And I don't even think Chet and Barbara, I know they didn't agree they didn't agree on several, <laughs> but but uh, they're both they're they're both very good Bible students. But I remember uh, I, my my appreciation for Barbara was extremely high. I did, I think when it came to spiritual understanding and maturity, that 
she is just, uh, she, she is a queen. And so uh, when we were talking about the covering and we had a difference, uh, I remember saying to Barbara, Barbara, I, I'm doing the best I can, and I know that you are too. I will say this. I said this to her. I said, God knows what the answer is to all this. And someday you're going to stand before God with your opinions, and I'm going to stand before him with mine. And he's not going to have any problem at all knowing who's right and how critical the, it was to understand uh, completely and thoroughly what he's having to say on this subject. It's true of any other subject. I said, just because a man like myself has an opinion doesn't mean that we're going to be in heaven because we admit, we admit it's an opinion. It doesn't mean that. I have an opinion. That don't have anything to do with whether God's going to accept it or not. We throw the word opinion at what if it's an opinion. Well, I said, no. I, I think it, this is kind of a critical subject, and if I'm wrong, I may have to, I may have to answer to God for it. And I'll say that, I'll say that to, to you in case you, you differ a little or differ a, a whole lot with, with what I'm going to say uh, as we work through this. Uh, okay. Uh, Paul really describes three headships here. Did, did you notice that? He, 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 disca he describes three. Uh, he's got Jesus is the head of the man. We understand that, don't we? He has the authority over, over men, over all of us, but over men. And then uh, man is the head of the woman. Uh, and we're going to see that, uh, we're going to see, and rest kind of dabbled in it just a little bit. We're, we're going to see that that is not unlimited, like the Christ headship is, is universal and complete. Man headship has, is confined with, within the areas, the bounds that God has, has put that authority in. And we can be confused and we can come to a wrong conclusion in, the first, in, in this chapter, really, in, in, in the Bible, if we fail to make distinctions like that. I think it's important that we do. And he says, and, 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 uh, uh, and God, of course, the Father, is the head of Christ. Christ submitted. He's God. He's God in every way. But he willingly submitted to the Father. Uh, uh, so, head, the idea of, of authority. He submitted. Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, now, having said that, Let's examine the two occasions wherein a woman must be, according to the Bible now, must be in subjection. She is to be in subjection to her husband. And you can go clear back to the first man and woman. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, which you find there on the screen, it says, this is after the fall, after the sin of eating the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. A curse if you will, is passed upon both of them. And let's look at what uh, he says uh, to the woman. Genesis 3, verse 16. And to the woman, God said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. Now notice, and he shall rule over you. Husband, right? Says husband. Doesn't mean every man thereafter, your husband shall rule over you. And then a passage that the Apostle Paul understood that very well in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 22 and, and 3. 
Paul said, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he, Christ, is the Savior of the body. Forgive me for just a moment. I want to make sure, I want to make sure I set my alarm so I know I have to quit. Because when you start hearing real loud noises up here that, that aren't mine, you're going to say, Ooh, no, I hope I got it but on vibration. But that's just kind of a, that's kind of a prayerful thought. With me setting my phone up. Now, uh, wives, submit to your husbands, Paul says. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he, Christ, is the Savior of the body. The husband is the head of the wife. The Bible just says that. Now we can spend, you know, as well as I do, we can spend several classes talking about what that means. We don't have time to do that. We just have, for now, uh, for now, just get started, accept what God says, and then if we need to talk more fully about these things, we'll, uh, or already said, we'll, we'll open up Wednesday, and if if we need to go further, we'll talk to the elders and see if they want to take, go even further. But now, and then the, the second area I want to talk to you about when it comes to what the Bible actually says. The husband, not every man in existence, the husband is said of the wife. But also, she must show submissiveness, accept authority with, within the church. In before I read that passage that's on the screen, I want to read 1 Timothy 2, 11. Uh, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. That word silence, by the way, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with it, but that word silence doesn't mean she can't say a word. It's, it's quietness. It, it, it's really just, a, a, again, it's an expression of humility. It's quietness. It, it doesn't mean she can't sing. It doesn't, doesn't mean she... She, she never has a place to speak up. It, the, word, the Greek word mean, just means quietness, not absolute silence. That's an entirely different word. The Greek has a word for that. We find that one a little later. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission. That's why I just said it's a word of submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to usurp authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived, she fell in, into trans, transgression. Now, again, it, it, it's submission or quietness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment after we, after we look at the verse that you find on the screen. Now, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, then let them ask their own husbands at home. For it is shameful for the women to speak in the church. Well, here's a, here's a principle. And, and there's, obviously there's argumentation over, well, is it just talking about uh, the, the wives of the prophets? Is, if it's any other woman, she can talk. Well, he, he enters here what the law says, and then he mentions, he mentions that once again. Uh, she can ask her husband at home, for it's shameful for a woman to speak in the church. We see in the passage we read in Timothy, she's not to be in a position. I, I suffer not a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. You have to bring the two together, I think, to have a clear understanding uh, of what he's talking about. And you also have to understand when he says, let your women keep silence in the churches. What, what is the church in the universal sense or everywhere? I don't think so. And the reason I don't think so is because God answers that question in that very same chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, in in uh, 
uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and we look at what does the Bible say. It says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 23, if the whole church comes together in one place. Now, I want to take just a minute to talk about that. What does that mean in one place? Well, the United States is one place. Does it mean in the United States? No, you know. It, it, Alabama, that's, that's a place. Does it mean that? Does it mean in Alabama? What does he mean when he says one place? Now I want to ask you this. When we are divided up as we are right now and we have, we have classes all around, are we in one, all together in one place? No. You know we're not. Now, there, there are brethren. I'm going to tell you for sure there are brethren that get really heated about that one. That, understanding what place is. You know, you know, we're in one place because we're all sharing, aren't we? We're all sharing. I was thinking even Philip's sharing right now because it's kind of confusing to me and it was to him as to when I was going to speak because he didn't know when to take a nap. So even everybody is in here. We pray together. We sing together. We're studying together. This, is, this room is one place. We're all sharing the same prayers. We're all together. Anything beyond that, whether it's the, the classrooms or whether it's like we used to be out underneath the trees, it, it, one place we're here. And it doesn't have to be here. It can be this whole group's out underneath the trees but you get the idea. We're all sharing in, in, in the same teaching, thoughts, prayers, and everything. I, I don't think that's really hard. I, it's, it, though it is certainly made hard. At times, it is. We're all sharing. Uh, this, is not, uh, this, this is not talking about Bible classes or, or it's talking about home studies. And, and I'm going to emphasize Bible classes. I uh, I absolutely love, I absolutely love how much Carmen has to say. And she speaks up quite a bit in Bible class. It's always with humility. And uh, yeah, as, as Terry and I have talked, she just, she sets a great example of what it means to participate. And yet, at the same time. Be feminine. There, it, it's a Bible class. It's designed so everybody. It, we're not all together. This is not a worship service where we're all together in one place. And that's what Paul says. Now, that's not what I'm making up. That's what, that's what Paul says. Uh, you know, I think it's good. It's good at times to stay away from history completely. But it sometimes it's quite helpful. Uh, and in the synagogue, in the Jewish synagogue, it was common. A, a, a man would read, and then, and then all other men were allowed, not just allowed, but encouraged to speak up. That They could speak up and add to the conversation, or they might have an entirely different approach, and it might be more like an argumentation period. They, they're debating. They don't agree. That was their services. That was the design of their services. That is not the design. And, and even then, with them, the men could do that in that service. But the woman could not. She couldn't speak of it. Now, when I think about that, Paul would have that in mind. I'm, I'm just saying, he, he would have that in mind. And with the questions, and you know it's brought out in nearly every class, how there no doubt were questions being asked of the Apostle Paul that you and I are not privy to. It would have been discussed outside of anything you and I have access to. It's not anything that's written down. We don't know. We see a lot of times, we see Paul's answers 
but we don't specifically know what the, the statement is. Paul is just going to say, there's, if there's any questions, any questions uh, he says about this, about uh, uh, the fact that, uh, that some might say that since we're Christians, we're in Christ, we're all free in Christ Jesus, and, and so we no longer have to be so concerned uh, about uh, uh, that which represented respect for authority. Now, again, uh, I, I don't want to forget. I want you to forget that the main point that Paul made in verse 3 is submitting to those who are in authority. And I put the verse back up there again. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. You know, even that much is not popular. You know it isn't in our culture today. The idea of, of man being the head. I, I had a wedding one time with some, uh, with some who, who were not members of the church. They, they, they didn't attend any church on a regular basis. But I, I, and I've told you this before, but I remember the, <laughs> the bride-to-be, she giggled loudly giggled when I said the husband, as they read this passage, the husband is the head of the wife. It's really just th this idea is, is in our society is, as a whole, it's not accepted, Keith. Yes. Like, yes. They see it as a role. Right. They see it as a position. And there's nothing about position here. It's all about the role in the order that God gave it. Uh, my, my hand doesn't work without my head, but if you take the head off the body, my head doesn't work either. Yeah. Like, I need both. To right. And, uh, and, and, and I, I think that, you know, what Paul is stressing here regarding Thank you. But Paul moves on then. He, he says uh, uh, that the covering is a sign in that time that the wearing the, the covering was a, a, it was a symbol or a sign of submitting to authority. That's kind of obvious as we read uh, what, what he has to say. He, he said, every man praying or prophesying having his head covered he dishonors his head. So the man wears the covering, it, dishon it dishonors his head. That's Christ. He's already said that. And we read that verse several times. Every moment, woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. So if she is uncovered, she dishonors her husband. Uh, for that is one and the same as if her head were shaved. For if a woman is not covered, Paul says, then let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or saved, then let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. Before we, we, we comment about that, I, I want to show you uh, a picture this is actually, uh, this is actually stone, and it's on a wall in a place in, in a place in Syria called Dura Europos. Uh, it's it's a uh, I think you call that kind of place a, 
It's not a, it's, the word's not frenzy. What's the word that's, it, it has to do with, with something that is artistic and it was, it could be made out of cloth, but this was actually on the stone, painted on the stone wall. Uh, here, it, and, you know, what, what is, is extremely interesting about Dura, your apostle, if you'll remember, uh, it, uh, we've, we've talked about Naaman, the king, or the general in the Syrian army who had leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 5. It happens to be that archaeology, there is a church right, cl- really close to the Jewish synagogue. And, and this artwork is, is all on the walls of that Jewish synagogue. And it's interesting how it was preserved. It was preserved because it was on the, on the outskirts of the city. And Rome was afraid of, of an attack. And they had, they had the buildings on the outskirts of the city filled with sand to fortify them. Now this is this is just a fact. You can look it up during your process. It's very fascinating. And archaeologists, as they do, dig, and they found the city, and they've uncovered. They 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 found that there there was a church of the Lord right there. But it, especially amazing, and I have I had so many graphics. I just I don't have time to. Uh, I, maybe some other time I can show you more of them. But this this is a. Uh, and by the way, this is around, uh, th- this would be around, the. it, it would be in the second century. It, it may be as much as, uh, as 200 years later. Well, I'm looking, I'm looking at my notes. It was dated by an Aramaic. Remember Jesus spoke Aramaic? It was dated by an Aramaic inscription, A.D. 244. So we're not looking at, at 30 A.D., but we're looking at, very closely in the, in the area of, of Jerusalem. And we're actually able to look at, at artistic pictures of how the women dressed, at least in this Jewish synagogue. And of course, remember, the Jews had synagogues all over. This is how they dressed. There's a couple of things I want to I want you to take note of. That's not like a burqa, is it? Like the the Muslim veil. Look at that. Look at look at the difference. You still it, you you still see the hair. You see the face, don't you? And you see the hair. It, it, if it's Muslim, you don't see those things. We don't know emphatically that this is the way they dressed at the time Paul wrote, but it's very likely. It sure fits in with things that he has to say. And so I, I just thought this was a, a, a very fascinating, fascinating picture. We're, we're looking at a picture in time. What was society like? What was the culture like at the time? Well, uh, uh, th- this tells us. And it, it, it's interesting uh, that uh, it wouldn't have been there if Rome hadn't filled it with sand to make it more fortified for invaders. Uh, it, it's, it's also interesting that, contrary to what you might read in here, and you, and you can read in here a lot of things, uh, in most of the pictures, uh, the men are wearing Roman garb. They're, they're, they have on kind of the Roman type toga. Remember, this is a this is a Gentile area, uh, and and they are they are bareheaded. That can be confusing. We're not we're not talking about being. We're not talking about being bald like Robbie. We're talking about they don't have a covering on. That's all that means. It, it doesn't mean their head shaved. It, it doesn't. If you look, it doesn't mean that. So it, it's just, it's just, uh, uh, 
And it's also interesting within this, remember, remember this, one of the invaders from time to time was the Persians. And there, there's, artist, there's, there's an artistic work on those walls of Persian men. The Jewish men, the, uh, among the Jewish men, the only one that had anything at all on his head was the priest. But among the Persian men, the men had on coverings. I, I'm just telling you what's on the walls there. So things were different in Persia than they were uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, notice, I, that I want to look, think about something Paul said. Didn't Paul, have we been emphasized that Paul said, I, I became all things to all men? As much as he could without violating the law of God, Paul was teaching a principle that that you need to, to be willing to do as those around you are doing. And especially if, if you do otherwise, it's, it's going to be in, bring any kind of reproach upon you uh, or on the church. Now, I think the biggest mistake that is made that's like anything else in this. Uh, not everyone's going to agree. They're certainly not going to agree with me. But I, I, I think it, it's a shame they, they can't, we don't all see this. Is that the Apostle Paul is not talking. He is not talking about putting it on. He's talking about keeping it on. That's certainly not something you hear very often in, in Bible classes, but he's talking about keep it on, not put it on, keep it on. I want to read something to you from uh, Tertullian, who was born in 160 A.D. in Carthage. Not bad, huh? <laughs> oh, so much for having that thing quiet. <laughs> All right, I got to wrap this up. Uh, but Tertullian, who was a, an early, a, a, an early writer, he was a Christian. Uh, he came from the same continent as the Ethiopian uh, eunuch. Uh, he, he was actually from Carthage, but but. Uh, and Tertullian was one of the first, if not the first, writer in that century that wrote prolifically. He had, he had a lot to write. There's a lot from him. And looking at Tertullian's writing, in this particular case, Tertullian, Tertullian was, was actually talking about Virgins, the veiling of, 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 of virgins, the, the unmarried. It, it was understood, if you read, it was understood that, that the women who were married wore coverings in public. But he says, well, but then if, it's a, if you're submitting to your husband, they don't have husbands, do they, uh, do they have to, to wear the covering? That... And I want to write, I want to read to you some things he wrote. Uh, he said, and I have the chapter and, you know, everything about this. He says, uh, and again, uh, and uh, he's, again, he, the assumption is that they all understood. There was no argument about, uh, about uh, the, the, the adult women who were married. Uh, he's, and I, I read, if on account of men they adopt a false garb, and he says, he's talking about uh, uh, out in public. They, they wear the covering out in public. Let them carry out that garb fully, even for that end. And he goes on to say, and I know the writing sometimes a little bit hard to understand. He said, as they veil their head in the presence of heathens, 
You were either a Christian or you were a heathen. There was nothing mean about that. He said, if they, wear, if, they, if they wear the covering, the veil, in the presence of heathens, then let them at all events in the church conceal their virginity, which they do, they do veil outside the church. He goes on to say, he got a lot to say, but he goes on to say, and I quote, he said, they fear strangers. They put on the veil because you better not be seen out in public in that culture without it. He said, they fear strangers. Let them stand in awe of the brethren too. Or else let them have the consistent hardihood to appear as virgins in the streets as well. He says, to what purpose then do they thrust their glory out of sight abroad? Their glory, their face, their hair. But they expose it in the church. Again, he's talking about keeping it on, not putting it on. That's what he's talking about. Keep it on, not putting it on. Uh, I'm going to go now to skip a little bit here because of time. He says, when, when the custom of the society that we live in, if it stands, where you, Paul says, I became all things to all men. If, if where you are living uh, and what is taught is not against God's word, but actually it may even stand for a spiritual truth, then you rebel against God when you go against such customs in society. In such societies where women all have long hair and are wear a covering as decent and proper practices, according to this verse, she might as well have her head shaved if she does not wear the veil. I think that when you're teaching a class, their minds jump from, from their culture to our culture. What what do we think? Uh, Tertullian makes it obvious that to, to see a woman out in public in their culture would have been looked upon badly. But what do we think when we see women out in society without a veil on? We don't have that custom. That's not the way, that's not what we do. That, it's, it, it's, we don't think anything about it at all. And so he's talking about that which society deems as inappropriate or appropriate that we need to be willing, as he's already said in previous chapters, to be willing to go along with the society. Uh, my time is up. I, I obviously didn't get through this, but uh, maybe we can talk more about it uh, uh, on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you, my brother.